Hey friends, this is Dave Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University, and this video is part three of a three-part series introducing you to antibiotics and how antibiotics work. What I want to talk about in this video are the modes of action, or the targets for antibiotics, right? Antibiotics do something very specific at the cellular and subcellular level, and we want to uh, think about those the antibiotics based on what they target and how they work. Sometimes that's called modes of action. Sometimes it's called mechanisms of action. I'm going to talk in general about these antibiotic targets and the main ways that antibiotics work. And we're going to focus on the beta-lactam antibiotics as an example. And then on your own, you're going to need to take that same approach to learning the other targets and classes. There's so many antibiotics out there and there are new ones coming out all the time. And so it's really important that you uh, come up with a strategy in your brain, not just rote memorization of a list of hundreds of antibiotics, but a way to organize them in your head in terms of how they work and what they're all about. Um, so that as you learn new ones, as new ones come on the market, you have a place for them. You know where they belong and what they're related to and, and what you can expect from them. I like this slide here because it shows the major ways that antibiotics work. So the, the biggest group of antibiotics are the cell wall synthesis inhibitors. <clears throat> These go after, they target specifically enzymes that build and maintain the peptidoglycan of bacteria. So these are enzyme inhibitors, which we've learned about before in class, that knock out the bacteria's ability to both maintain and repair, but also to build new peptidoglycan. So these are gonna be the penicillins, the carbapenems, the cephalosporins. These three right here, together we call the beta-lactams, and those are the ones I'm gonna focus on uh, in just a minute here. But then you can see there are others like vancomycin, um, bacitracin, which is topical, Isoniazid and ethambutol are only used against mycobacterium tuberculosis, or mycobacterium in general. They threw an antifungal in this figure, but right now we're focused on the antibacterial agents. So the number one most common uh, target um, for all of our antibiotics, something like 50% of all the antibiotics we use uh, are cell wall synthesis inhibitors. The next most common are the protein synthesis inhibitors. Protein synthesis inhibitors usually, almost always, mess with the bacterial ribosome. Now, it's a little tricky because we have ribosomes as well, and we don't want to knock our own ribosomes out. So there is the potential for some cross-reactivity with our own ribosomes, but bacterial ribosomes are different enough from human ribosomes that we can get that selectivity, that selective toxicity. So what groups are protein synthesis inhibitors? We've got the aminoglycosides, the tetracyclines and the macrolides are gonna be the most important right there. Chloramphenicol is used in research. It's used in some developing nations because it's so cheap, but it's also really toxic. And so for the most part, uh, most countries avoid using chloramphenicol in live humans. Okay, a couple others. There are some that disrupt the cytoplasmic membrane, and in particular, these are the polymyxins. Uh, think colistin. Colistin is essentially the drug of last resort for multi-drug resistant MDR gram negatives. So this would be like an E. coli strain that is multi-drug resistant and we don't have any other options. It's picked up plasmids, it's got a bunch of resistances to all the other important classes, and so we're gonna have to hunker down and use colistin. Colistin is really toxic to the patient, We'd rather not use it if we don't have to, but there's very little resistance. Although it is creeping up, there's very little resistance to colistin out there. <clears throat> so it's our drug of last resort for the multi-drug resistant gram negatives. In fact, let's go back up to our vancomycin at the top of the page where cell wall synthesis is. This is our drug of last resort for multi-drug resistant gram positives. Vancomycin is only good against gram positives. Very, very narrow range uh, of, uh, of bacteria that it can be useful against, but also highly toxic to the patient. Uh, it causes renal toxicity, ototoxicity, which means you can lose your hearing. We really don't want to go to vancomycin or colistin if we don't have to. And this is one of the biggest problems with the spread of drug resistance is that it forces us 
to use these drugs that we really don't want to use because they're so harsh. <clears throat> okay, down here at uh, 6 o'clock, we see inhibition of general metabolic pathways, and realistically, there's only one general metabolic pathway that it goes after. This is the pathway of folic acid synthesis. And for that reason, these are sometimes called antifolate drugs. These are the sulfa drugs. These are the, what you've heard of as sulfa drugs or antifolates. You probably haven't heard antifolates, but that's common clinically to refer to these as antifolates. These knock out a metabolic pathway. Bacteria don't consume folic acid, this vitamin, this coenzyme, folic acid. They don't consume folic acid from the environment like you and I do. They actually synthesize it themselves, which means we can knock out that pathway without hurting a patient because you and I don't have that pathway. And then the last category are those that in inhibit DNA or RNA synthesis. Uh, in particular, I want you to look at the quinolones and rifampin. Rifampin will knock out RNA synthesis. The quinolones like Cipro will knock out DNA replication, DNA synthesis. And the top one above that says inhibition of pathogens, attachment, or entry. Those are all antivirals, so we're not going to talk about those. So we've got one, two, three, four, five main targets uh, for the antibiotics. Number one, cell wall synthesis. Number two, protein synthesis. And the other three, I don't have a real good sense of uh, <clears throat> how predominant each of them is. They're all relatively common. We've got our cytoplasmic membrane disruptors, our sulfa drugs that go after the folic acid synthesis pathway. And then we've got the DNA replication inhibitors in the fluoroquinolones, and we've got transcription inhibitors in the rifampins. So how do you organize all this? There's so much with antibiotics. Start with the modes of action. Remember, there are five of these. So start with the modes of action and build a little branching diagram, uh, a tree, essentially. List all the different drug classes that fit under each mode of action. And we've learned the, some of the drug classes already in your reading. And in the last video, I showed you some of those drug classes in the Sanford guide. And then list some specific drugs under each of those classes. So then when you learn a new drug or a new drug is introduced five years, ten years down the road, you've got a place to put it. Oh, that fits into this particular class of this particular mode of action. So let's do this process for what we call the beta-lactam antibiotics, right? The primary modes, cell wall synthesis inhibitors, this is mostly our beta-lactams that we talked about earlier, our protein synthesis inhibitors, plasma membrane disruptors, nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors, and our antifolates. So we're going to focus on number one, inhibitors of cell wall synthesis, and in particular the beta-lactams. And then your job is going to be to go through numbers two through five and on your own work through them and make sure that you have a good sense of not only the mechanism of action, but the main classes of drugs that fit into those and some examples of specific drugs within each of those classes. So we're going with our mechanism of action, inhibition of cell wall synthesis, and we're going to look at the three most common classes, and these three are all beta-lactams. BLs, I'll put, beta Ls. Penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems. Penicillins were essentially the first natural antibiotic that we had to work with. Uh, discovered in the 1920s, put into action around 1940, just in time for World War II, where soldiers were dying not from their wounds, but from their wound infections. And so penicillin itself saved who knows how many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives in the 1940s. All the penicillins uh, have this purple shaded area here in common, and all of the beta-lactams have this square here that the organic chemists call a beta-lactam ring. That beta-lactam ring is essential for inhibiting the enzymes that polymerize peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Penicillin G and V are the natural penicillins that came on the scene originally, and then everything else is modified. And you notice they all end in psyllin in this case. So anytime you see something with psyllin, you know right away it's a penicillin derivative, and then your brain should automatically go to, okay, it's a cell wall synthesis inhibitor. Now, why do we have different penicillins? Two reasons. We modify them either to broaden their spectrum because natural penicillin is only good against 
gram positives because it needs access to the peptidoglycan and the uh, peptidoglycan and gram positives is exposed or um, to combat resistance, right? So if the bacteria came up with straight penicillin resistance, which we'll talk about in a later, uh, a later video, then maybe by tweaking the penicillin, and what we're tweaking primarily is this group here, by tweaking the penicillin, maybe the resistance won't be as effective and the drug will remain more effective against the, against the bacteria. So group number one is the penicillins. Unfortunately, uh, resistance to penicillins is really uh, high. It's really common. Uh, in fact, we introduced in 1940 the first penicillin, and by 1941 we were seeing uh, penicillin-resistant Staph aureus strains showing up. And so we started digging around saying, well, what's similar to this that maybe the bacteria can't be resistant to? And we came up with cephalosporins. Uh, the original cephalosporin also comes from a fungus, just like penicillin comes from a fungus. And it's also a beta-lactam, has that same beta-lactam ring. But it turns out that the bacteria that were resistant to the penicillins, it looked like these cephalosporins were going to be effective against them. So we thought, aha, we've overcome this bacterial resistance. <clears throat> and so first-generation cephalosporins included drugs like cephalexin, which we still use as Keflex. But we're unfortunately starting to see resistance showing up, and so we come up with a second generation. We tweak those original cephalosporins, and we make drugs like cephachlor. And within a few years, we start to see resistance. Third generation, drugs like cefotaxime. Fourth generation, drugs like cefepine. We're now currently on our sixth generation cephalosporins because we keep seeing bacteria rising that are resistant to the cephalosporins that we've, that we've created. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is they all start with ceph. It can either be CEPH or CEF. And as long as you see ceph, you know that we're talking about a cephalosporin. If you know we're talking about a cephalosporin, you know it's a beta-lactam and you know that it's a cell wall synthesis inhibitor, all because the drug name starts with Ceph. Isn't that convenient? So penicillins were great, started to see resistance, developed cephalosporins, great, seeing lots of resistance, and we've since developed carbapenems, which apparently I have more to say about cephalosporins. Sorry, I'll get to carbapenems in one second. Similar to the penicillins, here's our beta-lactam ring that needs to be there. They inhibit cell wall synthesis in the same way by knocking out the the enzymes called transpeptidases. Transpeptidases are what the cephalosporins and penicillins go after. They are naturally resistant to most beta-lactamases. We haven't talked about beta-lactamases yet, but keep this word in mind. Beta-lactamases are the main way, they're the main way that bacteria um, resist the penicillins in particular. But unfortunately, cephalosporinases showed up and, uh, and started ruining our party there. They tend to have a broader spectrum than natural penicillins. The natural penicillins were originally only good against gram positives, and we had to tweak them to get to broaden the spectrum. Natural cephalosporins seemed to be able to get across the LPS layer of some gram negatives. And so they had a slightly broader spectrum of activity and could be used a little more broadly than the original penicillins. Okay, sorry, now carbapenems. <clears throat> carbapenems are all gonna end in the, the, the suffix penem. These are all by injection or IV only. They all have nasty side effects. We avoid the carbapenems if we can help it. Um, these are uh, drugs we only use if we know the penicillins aren't gonna work because of resistance, the cephalosporins aren't gonna work because of resistance, and the other classes of drugs are not ideal for various other reasons. And then and only then are we going to go to the carbapenems and we're going to have to do it through IV or through in, um, injection. Very few bacteria have shown resistance to the carbapenems. We'll talk more about that later. But when they do show resistance to carbapenems, they end up showing resistance to all of the beta-lactams and we lose all of our options. So your job is to go through, your job is to go through all the targets, the five different classes of targets, antibiotic targets, cell wall synthesis inhibitors, protein synthesis inhibitors, plasma membrane disruptors, nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors, and the antifolate drugs, and then take the main classes right here of antibiotics and sort them into the appropriate targets, right? So we know penicillins are cell wall synthesis inhibitors. 
We know aminoglycosides are protein synthesis inhibitors and on down the line. And then come up with a few specific examples from each of these classes. That's your job as you study these antibiotics. Now, before we get into the lesson summary, let me just remind you from the Sanford Guide that these are, in fact, the main categories of the good or antibacterial agents. These are the main classes of, of drugs. Aminoglycosides is on your list. Antifolates, those are the sulfa drugs. Carbapenem, cephalosporins, we just talked about those. We're not going to worry about chloramphenicol for now. Fluoroquinolones are one of the categories you need to learn. Um, let's keep going down the line. A lot of these are important, but not, not yet. You'll learn them later. Macrolides, very important. Uh, penicillins, obviously important. Polymyxins, rifamycins, tetracyclines. You need to learn all of these. If we open up our tetracyclines, you can see the specific types. So, for example, um, doxycycline. I had an infection recently. They gave me doxycycline. And as a good microbiologist, I went straight to the Sanford Guide, read up on usage and dosing, uh, looked at my adult dosing, made sure everything was in, in, uh, in uh, accord with, with uh, good recommended standards right now, adverse effects to be aware of. I looked at the spectrum of activity, and sure enough, the bacteria they suspected was causing my infection was in there. So <clears throat> I'm not giving you random agents to learn. These are, in fact, the most important categories of antibiotics on the market today. So let's go to our lesson summary then. Most antibiotics that are out there, and there's a few exceptions, but most antibiotics target one of the five bacterial structures or processes that we just learned. The beta-lactams in particular, that would be your penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems, go after cell wall synthesis and repair. In other words, they go after the peptidoglycan. And there are those three, the penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and I gave you some specific information on each of those, penicillins being the oldest and original, and as, um, as resistance arose, we found cephalosporins, and as a re resistance has arisen there, we have uh, synthesized the carbapenems, and we're seeing to date very little resistance there, but history tells us we should expect resistance before too long. Go ahead and watch this video as many times as you need to, and by all means, don't think you're done. You need to go back to your textbook and you need to follow the instructions I gave you in this video and go through that same process of getting these organized in your head for all the other mechanisms of action in those major classes of drugs. The next series of videos is going to be on antibiotic resistance. Don't jump ahead to that series until you feel like you really understand these antibiotics and their targets because I'm going to really rely on a good understanding of those to talk about how resistance works. Good luck.